Hello, uh, Dr. Valentina Viduta, and I am founder of Long COVID Foundation. Today I'm a panelist and I will help you to learn on gut brain axis and learn more about the bacteria. So, looking forward to it. Thank you. And Mike? Hi there, um, I'm Mike Van Alzacker. I'm a neuroscientist uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about neuroimmune communication today. Okay, thank you. Uh, Georgia? Yeah, very, uh, very big welcome from my side. I'm excited for the second conference we are holding today, and I'm a panelist today. I'm Hi, I'm Leo Galland. I'm a physician and an independent researcher in the U.S. I'll be speaking today about uh, the gut-brain connection in COVID-19 with an emphasis on the gut microbiome. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Shankara Chetty uh, from South Africa. I'm a natural science biologist and a frontline worker. I've been looking at COVID from a clinical perspective from the start of this pandemic and hoping that we can get more insight into uh, long COVID. Excellent, thank you. And Stephanie? My name, my name is Stephanie Seneff. I'm a senior research scientist at MIT. I'm the author of this book, Toxic Legacy, How the Weed Color Glyphosate is Destroying Our Health and the Environment. The book talks a lot about the gut microbiome and interaction between the gut brain and the gut brain axis. I'm a panelist, so I'll just be asking some questions today, and I'm looking forward to hearing the presentations. Excellent, thank you. And we have Carlo. Hi, I'm Carlo Bronia. I am a doctor in the research of Ukrainian Group B3, and uh, today I will speak about the toxin and the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the long COVID condition. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Thanks for the question, guys. Thank you very much for everyone here. And again, um, we'll ask you all to hold on, but we're going straight away into our next speaker. And I'll take you gentlemen kindly out of the screen um, to Dr. Leo Galland. Um, from the USA. So, uh, Leo, I, I have the pleasure of being one of your panelists, so I look forward to your presentation, and um, I'm sure I'll have a number of questions for you. So I'm just going to share your screen, and um, can you bring up your PowerPoint on your screen first? So yeah. just... Um, uh, okay, here we go. There we go. Got Wonderful. it. And I'll, okay, I'll speak great. to you in about 20 minutes. Okay. I, I, first, I w I'd like to thank Valentina, Joachim and you, Philip, for inviting me to present the at this um, at this conference. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the um, role of uh, the gut-brain axis and, in particular, the microbiome in long COVID. Now, uh, that's the way we do it. Okay, um, I will start with an overview of the gut microbiome and its systemic effects. Um, look at the way that these effects impact brain function and repair. The impact of COVID-19 on the gut microbiome and the way that the gut microbiome may impact the course of COVID-19 and the risk of long COVID. Um, and then consider the gut as a reservoir for persistent SARS-CoV-2 infection. I'll be looking at research um, that's been done by many different people um, and suggest some of the strategies that I've advocated um, for therapeutic modulation of the gut microbiome to either prevent or reverse long COVID. Now, the big surprise of the Human Genome Project was the relatively small size of the human genome. We have about 25,000 functioning genes despite tremendous complexity and diversity of our species. Uh, in contrast, rice shows relatively little um, and is the fruit of this particular plant, Oriza sativa, has almost twice as many genes that have evolved over 15 million years. So how do we as humans manage to do so much with so little? Um, there are many scientists who believe 
that the answer to that is the human microbiome, which contains about 4 million genes. Now, genes are the templates for creating proteins, and there are two major types of proteins that are produced, structural proteins and enzymes. And enzymes are catalysts of biochemical reactions. Um, the gut microbiome basically represents the body's largest and most diverse ecosystem. There are about 100 trillion microbes there, 95% of the total. And there are more microbial cells in the gut than there are human cells in our body. Understanding the microbiome really requires answering two basic questions. Who's there and what do they do? Well, what they do is they produce a tremendous number of proteins, either structural proteins or enzymes. And those enzymes alter, create, destroy, and recycle. They do it to nutrients, they do it to toxins, to hormones, to human secretions. They may make nutrients more or less bioavailable. The structural proteins in particular stimulate the immune responses. Um, both the proteins and the structural proteins may modify systemic metabolism. They definitely alter gut immunity. They compete with pathogens. They activate the enteric nervous system, which corrects, connects directly with the brain. Uh, much of that connection is through the vagus nerve, but not all of it. Uh, and they influence protein function in brain and muscle. Now, the structural components of the gut microbiome are recognized by the innate immune system's pattern recognition receptors. Microbial metabolism of host secretions and ingested substances yields products that impact human cellular function. Over 95% over 90 of the chemicals circulating in your blood originate with your gut microbiome. We know this from looking at germ-free animals who have no microbiome, and, and they have a tiny fraction of the number of chemicals uh, that are found in circulating in blood uh, compared to wild-type animals. Now, some of these substances are neurotoxins. Uh, two that have been well studied are ammonia and D-lactic acid. Um, D-lactic acid is not produced by human cells, but only by bacterial cells. Some of these substances may trigger systemic inflammation, which then impacts the brain through some of the mechanisms that Mike described. In particular, um, what's been studied are LPS or lipopolysaccharides, which are part of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, and peptidoglycans, which are part of the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria. Um, some of these substances are directly and actively anti-inflammatory and stimulate tissue repair. And probably the most important and certainly the most studied of these is a short-chain fatty acid called butyrate or butyric acid. Now in the brain, and butyrate being um, a short chain fatty acid passes readily through membranes. It um, goes from the colon where it nourishes the colonic lining and um, supports energy production directly into the body and it gets readily into the brain. And in the brain, butyrate stimulates the synthesis of a substance called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, at least in laboratory animals, which is really an important mechanism that the brain uses for repair. Now, there's some substances that are produced that may be helpful or harmful depending on their concentration and other factors. One of these is hydrogen sulfide, a gas. Uh, hydrogen sulfide in the brain actually is neuroprotective, but in the gut causes inflammation, although it may depend on whether you're dealing with the stomach or the colon. And then there's a short chain fatty acid similar to, um, to butyrate called propionate or propionic acid. And although many benefits of propionic acid on peripheral metabolism have been demonstrated, in the brain, propionic acid may contribute to autistic syndrome behaviors. 
Um, now, the question of who's there. Well, first, there are bacteria. And each individual, each person probably has a thousand different species. Second are viruses. Now, most of these viruses are bacteriophages. That is, these are viruses that inhabit bacteria. And they alter the metabolism of the bacteria. Um, there are fungi, mostly yeasts, about 15 species. There are archaea. These are primitive species that um, look like bacteria, but they produce methane gas. There are protozoa, which are one-celled animals, and helminths, or worms. And virtually everybody uh, in the world harbors these. Now, taxonomy is the organization of taxa, which is the way that we understand and classify who's there. And it goes from kingdom as the broadest um, category um, and phylum next broadest down to species and strain. Um, there's tremendous complexity and diversity of the microbiome. For example, bacteria and archaea, which look identical under the microscope, actually exist in separate kingdoms. Um, plants and animals exist in separate kingdoms. And, and these distinctions are confirmed by DNA sequencing. Um, lactobacilli and bifidobacteria, which are generally thought of as probiotics, they're kind of lumped together, they actually are in separate phyla. Now, humans and eels share the same phylum. So that gives you an idea of the diversity of the organisms that are present. To complicate that matter, different strains of the same species may have divergent, even opposite effects. Bacteroides fragilis strains, for example, may prevent autism, but they may also promote colon cancer. When we add to this complexity, the role of bacteriophages in altering bacterial metabolism, um, this is beyond quantum physics meets rocket science in its complexity. Now, in general, diversity and balance create a healthy ecosystem. So health is usually associated with a greater variety of taxa at all levels and with a greater evenness in the richness of different taxa. Groups of unrelated taxa support one another by creating interdependent feeding networks called syntropic clusters. Um, so basically the microbiome consists of complex dynamic microbial communities and that complexity is increased by the activity of bacteriophages. Now, within this understanding, there are some bacterial species that are called keystone species. That is, they are major taxa that support other species to hold the whole system together. And one of the most important of these is Fecalobacterium prausnitzi. It is a major producer of butyrate. And butyrate, in addition to everything that it does to support the colon lining, uh, to oppose inflammation and, to, uh, and its effects in the brain, also supports the growth of bifidobacteria, which ferment butyrate uh, further. Um, and the end product of that is acetate. Another um, keystone species, Acromancia mucinifila, is receiving a lot of attention. Uh, so far, I haven't found a positive role for it in the setting of COVID-19. Now, Fecalobacterium prausnitzi um, is a major anti-inflammatory species. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, is associated with a reduction in F. prausnitzi and other species that are frequently described as anti-inflammatory with decreased bacterial diversity and with an increase in pro-inflammatory species of the family called enterobacteriaceae, which are basically gram-negative aerobic bacteria. That is, they grow well when oxygen is present. Um, CFSME is also associated with elevation of blood markers that indicate increased penetration of the body by microbes, microbial translocation, uh, uh, 
like lipopolysaccharides or lipopolysaccharide binding protein and soluble CD14. So there's increased intestinal permeability, the so-called leaky gut, which is demonstrated in people with CFSME. Now, dysbiosis, a term that's been used um, in this symposium, basically represents an imbalance or instability among the many organisms of the microbiome that alters the ecosystem, creating undesirable effects on the health of the host. Stress can create dysbiosis. Now, mostly I'll be talking about the effects of dysbiosis on the brain, uh, the central effects, but the brain itself can create a dysbiosis. And that, it, at least in part, is mediated by stress hormones. So adrenaline, which is produced by the uh, sympathetic nervous system, and noradrenaline can selectively encourage the growth of some pathogenic bacteria. This has been demonstrated for E. coli. And adrenaline, in addition, can make bacteria like E. coli produce more toxins. So we know that people who are under stress are more prone to bacterial infection. This occurs, let's say, with surgery, for example. And um, most of the time we've thought about this as, well, stress is suppressing the immune system. What hasn't been fully appreciated is that the stress hormones directly stimulate the growth of some of these pathogenic bacteria. Um, these toxic bacteria can break down the intestinal barrier, creating aggr or aggravating the leaky gut. Um, this gut leakiness allows greater penetration of these toxins into your body. Um, and there's evidence that um, stress management techniques, meditative practice, and yoga can help to control this chain of events. Now, inflammation and dysbiosis exist in a vicious cycle. And I think that's something that has not received the attention that it deserves because you need to break that cycle for probiotics, for example, to be able to have a positive impact. What inflammation does is to increase the concentration of nitrates in the inflamed tissue. It does this by increasing the synthesis of nitric oxide, an important mediator of inflammation. A high nitrate environment changes bacterial growth patterns. Anti-inflammatory bacteria like F. prausnitzi tend to have their growth stunted in a high nitrate environment, whereas pro-inflammatory bacteria, especially E. coli and other gram-negative pathogens, their growth is stimulated. So their growth then creates more inflammation and maintains a high nitrate concentration. This is a feed-forward loop. From the perspective of the bacteria, it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, but this is this is why inflammation needs to be addressed directly for dysbiosis uh, to be controlled. Now, SARS-CoV-2 in the gut creates dysbiosis. One mechanism by which it does this is independent of, the, of inflammation. SARS-CoV-2, as is well known, enters human cells through attachment to the vital enzyme ACE2. When it attaches to ACE2, its entry into the cells decreases ACE2 activity. This has been demonstrated in, um, in, in uh, blood vessels, in the laboratory. Um, it's been demonstrated in numerous tissues. Now, ACE2 has a particular function in the gut that is unique. Aside from its role as a vital enzyme, it acts as a chaperone for the transport of certain amino acids into the body. So the loss of ACE2 in the small intestine, that is an enteric ACE2 deficit, impairs absorption and particularly affected more than any other amino acid is tryptophan. The loss of tryptophan depletes serotonin in the gut and the loss of serotonin diminishes the synthesis of these important uh, proteins called defensins that help to regulate the composition of the gut microbiome, prevent viral and other types of infections. So 
the effect of the loss of SAR of ACE2 by SARS-CoV-2 infection is to produce a gut bacterial dysbiosis. Now, there is an impact of COVID-19 on the gut microbiome that has been measured and that has been shown to persist for months. Um, this includes decrease in bacterial diversity and an increase in the relative numbers of pro-inflammatory species. There's also an effect on the fungal part of the microbiome. There's an increase in fungal richness. Candida albicans, Candida auris, Aspergillus flavus have all been shown to increase. Um, and Candida auris has received a lot of attention lately because it is a drug resistant, very dangerous fungus um, that is killing people in hospitals. Now, researchers at um, University of Massachusetts found that there was one particular species that when increased was associated with increased mortality. Um, and this is Enterococcus fecalis. Now, Enterococcus fecalis is sometimes used in certain probiotics. It, it is an immune stimulatory species. It is a potent inducer of gamma interferon. And uh, gamma interferon plays a role in driving the cytokine storm of severe COVID. Now, the keystone depleted species is Fecalobacterium prausnitzi. Um, and um, that, is, um, that, that is lost in the course of COVID-19. The mechanism by which it's lost isn't clear. And so I'm fascinated by Dr. Bronia's work, which explains um, a mechanism that I had not anticipated. Now, another study looking at F. Prausnitsky um, found that the gut microbiome at disease onset predicts the development of PASC. Um, and the gut microbiome of patients who develop PASC is characterized by lower levels of F. Prausnitsky when they first get sick and higher levels of, an, of a couple of other species um, Ruminococcus navis in particular can be very inflammatory. Um, the largest inverse correlation between the development at PASC at six months and the microbiome at the time of disease onset was with these butyrate bacterial species, F. Prausnitsky, and also a bifidobacterium species called Pseudocatenulatum. Um, another issue that has come up within the setting of COVID-19 is whether persisting viral um, infection can contribute to PASC. Uh, there are a number of studies. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into all of them here. Um, but there are a number of studies indicating that it's likely that there is continuing viral infection in people who develop PASC. And this has been looked at in people with neurologic symptoms. A program that I've put together is a high fiber polyphenol rich diet, which increases the growth of F. Pausnitzi. Adherence to a Mediterranean diet increases F. Pausnitzi, uh, F. Pausnitzi. Prebiotic oligosaccharides may as well. Um, we can raise the question, and maybe we'll try to answer this, whether that's actually desirable given Dr. Bronia's work. Um, there are several probiotics and prebiotics that increase the growth of F. Prausnitzi. And I just, um, I'm going to pass over the role, the impact of the gut microbiome on cytotoxic T lymphocytes, unless you want me, you want to give me a, an extra minute or two, Philip. Yes, go ahead. I think that's okay. what we'll do is we'll, we'll kind of deduct it from our discussion. Okay. Yes, go ahead right. with that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's become very clear that the, that the outcome of COVID-19 is very much impacted by T lymphocytes, in particular cytotoxically C lymphocyte, T lymphocytes that kill virally infected cells. They play an important role in recovery from viral infection. They're critical for vaccine-induced protection 
against this virus. And I think there's been way too much influence, um, importance attributed to neutralizing antibodies. It's really the T effector memory cells that are cytotoxic lymphocytes that are important for protection. Now, lactobacillus consumption through yogurt, fermented foods, or as a supplement increases the number and activity of cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Lactobacillus plantarum um, may be particularly important. And the question of whether do you want to give probiotics to people with COVID-19 because of the bacteriophage action of, um, of the virus, uh, I think that's a very important question. I've only seen one study that might suggest an answer to that, a study from Spain, and I don't have a slide on it, I hadn't prepared for it, in which um, a fixed probiotic uh, combination that included a strain of lactobacillus plantarum was given to people who are acutely ill versus uh, placebo. And the people who got the probiotic had a much better, they had a shorter course and a better outcome than people who did not, who received the placebo um, that did not contain the probiotics. So at least when it comes to lactobacilli, there's evidence of benefit. Um, the, um, yeah, there are a couple of other things that may enhance T effector memory cells, um, which are a specific type of cytotoxic T cells. Um, these cells thrive on fatty acid oxidation the availability of butyrate and the presence of lactobacilli. So a high fiber, adequate fat, low sugar diet with fermented foods may be helpful. Carnitine has been shown to help their development and may be a worthwhile dietary supplement. Now, um, just coming back and uh, trying to close the circle on bacteriophages. Um, there is some work looking at dietary factors that impact bacteriophage activity. Um, and I think this is an important area uh, for research. Polyphenols, especially bioflavonoids, disable or kill bacteriophages. Um, and the mechanism is inducing structural damage to the capsid, inhibiting their infectivity and their activity. Oregano oil has been shown to suppress multiple types of prophages, preventing their cellular entry an impact on bacteria. In contrast, the natural sweetener stevia has been shown to promote multiple um, species of phage um, to increase in activity and in impact, increase their impact on bacteria. And uh, stevia is very widely used by people who are trying to avoid sugar. Um, uh, it would be interesting to look at the relationship between stevia use and the outcome of COVID-19. Thank you for your attention and the extra time. Excellent, thank you very, very much. This is uh, very interesting to me. So I will not start with my questions. I will let Valentina go first. And um, we'll, we'll probably have to shorten this period, but when we go to the open forum, we can expand on any further questions when we bring everyone in. So go ahead, Valentina. So thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Gallant for his huge contribution to the knowledge at Long COVID Foundation, where Dr. Gallant has shared many informational presentations. So I would like to take this opportunity and invite our listeners who suffer with Long COVID to join Long COVID Foundation's channel. And I believe you can find the link under this video. Uh, so for now, I would like to proceed to some questions to understand the importance of gut microbiome, because people who suffer with long COVID, they are completely confused from which angle to start treatment. So uh, what is your view, knowing that we have um, seen um, Dr. Uh, Bronia uh, presentation and discussion about the combined treatment of antibiotics together with probiotics. So there is lots of information that antibiotics don't work on, on viruses. Uh, so it's a little bit confusing for people maybe to understand the real benefit of antibiotics during acute illness. And uh, then in terms of um, the effect of antibiotics might do on gut microbiome. How difficult it is to 
choose the right probiotics uh, to restore the gut microbiome? Um, yeah, these are really good questions and they're not easy to answer, Valentina. Um, As always. <laughs> also, you know, Dr. Bronya's work was called to my attention by you about two weeks ago. And I, I just haven't had a chance um, to, um, to really figure out how I would um, work that into the protocols that I'm using with patients. Uh, I share his belief that um, widespread antibiotic use is not the answer. Um, and I think that there are a lot of risks there. there. Over the past two years, since the onset of the pandemic, there have been practitioners um, who have advocated the use of antibiotics. Azithromycin is frequently administered, uh, sometimes doxycycline, and um, sometimes with other substances. Uh, I would, I've only seen one, I've seen one study which looked, was kind of a retrospective analysis as to whether azithromycin seemed to improve outcome with acute COVID and it did not. So in that, in that study. So I, um, I'm not sure where I would go with antibiotics. I like the idea of rifaximin because it's not systemically absorbed, but it's ridiculously overpriced. So I don't think that's a solution either. Um, I would like to, I mean, I think the future there is going to be found with bioflavonoids and determining what are the bioflavonoids that are most able to disable, uh, that are to disable the bacteriophage activity of the virus. Um, there also, there is a probiotic, when it comes to probiotics, it's kind of hard to know what's the ideal probiotic. What are you trying to accomplish? Originally, when I saw the data on F. prausnitzi and butyrate production being inversely associated with outcome of COVID-19, I thought of this as being a manifestation of previous diet and lifestyle. That is, healthier people have more F. prausnitzi and they have better, greater butyrate production. So I thought we were just looking at, a, at an epi phenomenon. Yeah, the reason that these people are doing worse is because they were not healthy to begin with and they had an, all health, an unhealthy microbiome to begin with. Dr. Bronia's work suggests that maybe the infection itself is really the main driver for this kind of dysbiosis. And so the question is, well, do we want to build up F. prausnitzi or don't we? Um, maybe we, we want to do something else. Their they're lactobacilli, I think, are more likely to have a positive effect, um, especially plantarum. Um, and so the use of fermented foods or lactobacillus plantarum supplements is the direction that I would like to look in at this point. Um, there, also, there are this class of organisms called soil-based organisms. The, spe the genus is Bacillus, um, uh, Bacillus clausii, which uh, Carlo mentioned is one species within that genus. Um, there are others. Bacillus subtil subtilis has gotten a lot of attention. And there's a particular uh, strain of that um, that uh, was originated actually in, in Ukraine um, and is still available that generates alpha interferon which kills this virus. So I've used that particular product with patients and sometimes seen really excellent results, especially when they have GI symptoms that are part of COVID-19. And I attributed that to the impact of the alpha interferon being produced in the gut and killing the virus. Thank you so much. Uh, if I may, Philip, uh, have a couple Go ahead. more yes. questions. So you said some bacteria can produce toxins. And uh, what would, would be the best available protocol to detox intestines from your experience? And would it make sense to have some kind of zeolites or charcoal or humic acid? Well, all of those may be possible. I just haven't been using them. I hadn't been thinking about long COVID as really a manifestation of bacterial toxicity but rather as the absence of 
butyrate producing bacteria. So my protocols have been finding ways to enhance the growth of healthy bacteria, um, control inflammation, which is essential, usually with um, substances like curcumin and resveratrol, uh, quercetin. And the important thing in dealing with natural products like this is um, there can be big problems when you're trying to go from laboratory to clinical practice because they're not that well absorbed. Um, if we're dealing with the gut, systemic absorption and systemic effects are not so important because you really want the effects in the gut. So if something like quercetin is not well absorbed, but it stays in the gut, well, maybe that's where you want it. Ken. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And the last question for me would be, as I usually do at the Foundations channel, we take some questions from our patients who suffer with long COVID and share their best experiences about the disease. So there is a question from a person who suffers with uh, mast cell activation uh, and dysbiosis. So if there is a dysbiosis in the gut and deficit of some bacteria, for example, enterococcus species, so which are in kind of histamine builder. So how smart it would be to take probiotics, which grow histamine building bacteria, especially when you have mast cell activation and you need to take probiotics to decrease histamine. Very practical question. Maybe yeah, I, I think it is. I, I, in, in many of my, well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that mast cell activation and histamine intolerance, although they often overlap, are not exactly the same. That is, there are people who have mast cell activation syndromes who are not particularly histamine intolerant. Um, and there are other chemicals that the mast cells are releasing that are making them sick. And then there are people whose problems are related to histamine intolerance. They have difficulty breaking down histamine. This might be due to a copper deficiency or a methylation problem. Um, and they may not have a general mast cell problem. There are probiotic bacteria that either produce histamine or break down histamine. And um, when I'm working with patients with mast cell problems or histamine intolerance, uh, I will generally recommend probiotics that are histamine, that break down histamine. And they're specific, and this is strain specific. This is not even species specific. Okay, thank you so much. That's all for me. I, I, I will leave my point to one because we're running out of time, but I'll, I'll ask some questions afterwards. But I'll just say, Leo, you are right on my area of research with what you've said, especially with the tryptophan bit. This is something I am focused on, the immune-mediated mechanisms in COVID-19. I'm going to make a statement, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I could predict the patients who were going to get long COVID before they've got COVID. And it's really because of three symptoms, diarrhea, bloating, and constipation. If they had any of those symptoms before they had COVID, I found that they had high risk clinically of getting long COVID. And it tended to mirror inflammatory bowel disease, where the highest percentage of patients who got long COVID had IBD. So I eventually came to a, a, a conclusion that I'm currently looking into, which is that the gut microbiome is altered in IBS and IBD. And actually, when you look at celiac disease, it also has an altered gut microbiome. Is it feasible that this is primarily because if there is a previous allergy in the gut, that is producing IgA, it's damaging the microbiome and then making people more vulnerable for gut-related symptoms. Well, that certainly could be the case, Philip. And, and if, the other thing is that um, allergic reactions in the gut and inflammation in the gut increase its leakiness. They increase the permeability. So then you get increased absorption of things like the lipopolysaccharides. Um, uh, it's... This, what happens with COVID-19 and with long COVID is really, really complex. There are multiple systems that interact with one another. Um, and I don't think we're going to find one path 
that ties everything together. Yes, yes, that's a that's a good, but that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the holy grail. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I sent Valentina a scheme that uh, I put together a, a diagram called the Web of Long COVID, which was kind of the best I could come to trying to, uh, in a visual way, express the inter relationships between different symptoms systems and uh the symptoms are not in there but organs and systems um and functions are and the way a lot of this derives from the fundamental effects of the virus starting with the destruction of ace2 uh on viral entry I'm going that's to be, really true yeah. and yes uh, i would like to say that the complexity of long COVID, as we see now it's even more complex and uh, i think it's very important that we are all here tonight and we are bridging some gaps between the brain and microbiome and we have this opportunity to discuss and maybe rethink our future uh, strategies on treatments. So that's uh, my big thank you to all of you who are here today. So I let you continue, Philip. Mm -hmm.